I think we are ready to commence. Kuliswa, uh, Melissa, can we commence? Yes, Prof, please go ahead. Great. Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, on behalf of the University of KwaZulu-Natal, I extend a warm welcome to you to this public webinar, webinar hosted by the College of Humanities titled Public Schooling in a Post-COVID South Africa, Implications for School Leadership. A special welcome to our eminent presenters, uh, Ms. Nomarashia Kaluza, uh, Mr. James Ndleba, Ms. Landy Diamond, Professor Vitalis Chikoko, and Professor Raj Mestri. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, there is a growing body of scholarship on schooling during the COVID-19 pandemic, which engages with a diversity of issues, including, you know, social emotional care of learners and staff, online pedagogies, social justice issues, uh, managing of schools and community partnerships in uh, pandemic times. However, you know, we want to set this aside for now and move beyond the present in terms of the pandemic and look ahead at what public schools and schooling would look like post the pandemic. Specifically, you know, we seek to make visible the implications post pandemic schooling has for the different strata or layers of uh, school leadership. You know, uh, if we take our cue from uh, Arundhati Roy, you know, who is a prominent author and uh, human rights activist, in a post pandemic, we should not seek to retreat to a pre pandemic world. Rather, we should see the pandemic as a portal between one world and the next. If we are to see the pandemic as a gateway for change, and a conduit to reimagine schools and schooling. What should public schooling look like in South Africa post the pandemic? What are the implications of this re-envisioned schools and schooling for the different tiers and layers of school leadership? To address these issues and more, we have five presenters this afternoon. Uh, before we engage with the presenters, let me give you an overview of the structure of the webinar. You know. uh, each presenter will be given a maximum of eight minutes to speak. Uh, and of course, they'll be addressing the webinar theme. And yeah, I am appealing to the presenters to please keep to the allotted time for time management purposes. Uh, after the collective of uh, presentations, uh, we'll have about 30 minutes for questions and comments from you, the online audience. So I appeal to you to please post your questions and comments on the Zoom question and answer facility during the presentations. Uh, and please do this, you know, post your questions, comments, whilst the presentations are in progress. Uh, also note that uh, we are streaming this webinar live on YouTube as well. So if you do lose connectivity, you can also connect on YouTube. And I'm certain that uh, uh, Ms. Kuliswa Zulu will post the YouTube uh, link on the chat. So with that said, you know, now that we've set the scene as well. So let's get start, let, let's get the webinar rolling, so to speak. Uh, you know, in terms of the presenters, the, the biography uh, of the presenters were sent to you with the invitation. Therefore, I'll be very brief in my introduction of the presenters. Our first presenter uh, this afternoon is Ms. Damarishia Kaluza. Ms. Kaluza is a 
Deputy Principal and the KwaZulu-Natal Provincial Secretary of SATU. Notably, at the Education International World Congresses in 2015 and 2019, she presented a resolution against privatization and commercialization in and of education. And further to that, she also facilitated a panel discussion on decolonization of education. So with those few words about uh, Ms. Kaluza, I hand over you know, the floor to you, Ms. Kaluza. Over to you. Thank you, Prof, and uh, good afternoon to my fellow presenters and to the two organizers. I'll request to switch off my video so that uh, I have a smooth presentation. <clears throat> Thank you, Prof. Without wasting time, the topic today is on public schooling in a post-COVID South Africa implications for the school management. And to start off, <clears throat> I'm just reminded, Prof, of um, the words of Karl Marx, where he states that philosophers have interpreted the world, but the point is to change it. And during these times of COVID, where many countries, including South Africa, have been in crisis situations with schools and schooling experiencing stop and goes as part of the COVID-19 imposed challenges, thus affecting delivery of quality public education and also challenging the leadership capabilities of our school managers and leaders. Crisis situations are characterized by ever increasing challenges scarcity of knowledge and information such that even the known solutions also become scarce during the crisis. This may be the situation that is currently confronting our school leadership. The crisis situation facing schools today challenge their leadership capabilities as said earlier on. Though in a different context, these scholars argue that the school leadership must be empowered with sufficient and necessary leadership skills and expertise to lead and manage change so that even when faced with challenging situations, schools must remain productive. In presenting my, uh, my presentation outline, I will cover the exacerbated inequalities collective trauma and learning, pedagogy and content, and then I will present suggestions for the way forward. To start with, the inequalities exacerbated by, by COVID have resulted in, in the society facing a time lost in terms of learning, others call the, 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 the lost learning or lesson lost the infrastructure inadequacy that also has been exposed by COVID, not introduced, but uh, exposed. The digital divide that has widened, but also exposed, exposed to us that um, the society is uh, very much divided and the inequalities are still there. Also, the poor disproportionately affected in terms of uh, the government, in particular, attending to issues of equality, other than um, making sure that uh, you attend and you lift those that are the most affected, the poorest of the poor. The legacy of apartheid as a rotational timetabling, we continue to see rotational timetabling, rotational attending to schools, meaning that not all learners go to school every day, every time, and getting the same lesson. Dropouts are increasing as well as teenage pregnancy is also on the increase. These are things that we currently observe, and there are studies that have also exposed or found that these are the realities confronting the society. The education budget, I'm also noting that um, once we are faced with this crisis, the education is also facing budget cuts, 
which therefore impacts on, on schooling as no temporary educators can be appointed where teachers are incapacitated because of COVID, freezing of essential posts and poor quality PPEs for the poor, uh, for the poor learners and teachers which takes most of the time instead of pushing forward with teaching and learning. There must be conversations and debates around the provision of PPEs and quality PPEs. Now, <clears throat> coming to the collective trauma and implications for learning and teaching, as we all know, that currently the situation is such that both teachers and learners, as well as their parents, they, they, there is trauma, there's anxiety, and what are the implications for, for learning and teaching? I identify these uh, uh, the three aspects, issue of mental health, where I believe that it's important that the, the, there must be discussions around mental health, which I, 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 I think is very critical in our schools, also through uh, conducting surveys to address the invisible scars of, uh, of COVID. As we know, we have learners and teachers, education workers infected and affected, but also importantly for leadership is to ensure that the classroom environment creates the self-care and gives the self-care to, to both the learners and teachers, and also reorientating the learning for mental wellness, and that will be empathy. Of importance, I know that currently when there is this uh, COVID, the pressure, the anxiety, and also the pressure to, 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 to make sure that learners learn, there's a lot of homework and a lot of pressure that is put on learners. And I'm saying piling learners with homework will prolong healing. Learners must be allowed whilst learning, they must also be playing, hence the importance of recess also assist in, 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 in ensuring that parents, professionals, also cope with the stress through providing psychosocial services that is lacking currently. Then on pedagogy and content, and I'm asking if this is enough as we consider the implications. Starting with is the current training that is provided to teachers. I think it is concerned, <clears throat> uh, concerned about content and pedagogy in, in the sea of fears, as everyone fears, the, uh, fears COVID and anxiety that, that we are currently observing. The new ways, therefore, for post-COVID require very social, emotional, and cognitive demands of teaching itself. But also, I'm noting the that currently there are prescribed plans for teachers common tests and everything, lessons that are imposed to schools. And I'm saying lack of flexibility in teaching plans are pre-COVID and cannot continue to exist post-COVID. Therefore, there's a need for flexibility based on professional teacher judgment and also cultivating staff well-being to promote a creative, calm, and relaxed environment. Again, when it comes to assessment, the, the old orthodoxies cannot address the new environment which is post-COVID. Therefore, teacher and professional autonomy in assessing remains paramount. Collaborative professionalism among and between schools with flexible time for department heads and schools to give feedback and strategize at cluster or circuit level. And this emphasizing uh, the point for the professional learning communities which are led and which must be led by teachers themselves. Then the suggestions for way forward to quickly, as you would see, the dub, double down on foundational learning in line with the National Development Plan. Develop digital learning infrastructure by not, by not just providing the resources like the tablets and all, but also follow that with training develop infrastructure to accommodate playing as part of the healing process post-COVID. Learner retention through psychosocial support as said earlier to both teachers and learners. Decolonize the curriculum to explore the power of context and culture, which is also very important. Promotion of adaptability, flexibility in the classroom practice. Knowledge management and enabling, enabling information sharing among educators. This, in my view, is time for collaborations, partnerships, and to ensure that the teachers and, uh, and the leadership share their experiences 
to, to pave their way forward post-COVID. Deliberate and, ta and targeted teacher and professional development programs, as well as rethinking the education financing, which is also so important. Towards the end, Prof, consistency in the application of traditional school leadership principles. That is a clear vision, developing others through building capacity to lead, manage and unite people at the level of the school. Is, it will remain very important. And this will facilitate uh, trust building, honesty and integrity. Things that are so lacking currently where there's a distrust at the level of the classroom, at the level of the school, uh, especially because of COVID and what appears to be failure and challenges around managing the situation, this crisis uh, situation. Establish social dialogue with education unions to the extent of forming partnerships with them, I believe they are critical at this point. Guarantee the protection of rights of all education workers and develop consultations with the unions to ensure that actions taken after the pandemic are inclusive and comprehensive. And I believe that uh, this will facilitate ownership of all the actions that will be taken and had to be implemented post-COVID. Protect the right to education. Advocate for learning all the time. And on this, I'm referring to the constitutional uh, uh, obligation of the government or the state to, to, to give learners education or children education, access to education. But I'm saying now, I think it is more about the issue of access, but it must be more about what really takes place inside the classroom because currently as things stands, you'll find that learners do go to school, but they are not being taught because they don't have teachers. Teachers are on and off because of COVID. There's anxiety, there's fear. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that input, uh, Ms. Kaluza. Uh, I like some of the issues that you raised, you know, around uh, rotational learning and its implications regarding the lost teaching and learning time. And that has implications post-pandemic for school leadership as to how we make up for that lost teaching and learning time due to rotational learning. And I also take note of uh, some of the other issues that you raised around uh, mental health and empathy. And you are now pointing us in a direction of engaging in a pedagogy of care. And uh, you know these are some issues to think about. And I'm certain a little later on uh, in our uh, discussion session, uh, we'll take up some of these issues. So, Let's move on then. You know, our next presenter is uh, Mr. James Endleber. Mr. Endleber is Director of Education Management and Governance Deve Development at the Department of uh, Basic Education. He has a rich history of service to the Department of Education at different occupational levels. He is a, pub he is a published author and has presented scholarly papers at a number of local and international conferences. Uh, Mr. Endleber, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, thank you to the organizers and the audience. I'm not sure if my presentation is visible, Prof. Yes, uh, yes, it is visible, but uh, uh, if you can please put it on slideshow. It is on slideshow, Prof. Oh, wonderful. Yes, you can see it. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I, I swear I, I did not share the notes with Noma Rashir. But, but there are a lot of similarities in what you are saying. Um, I think pre-COVID, 
And now during the COVID era, the department is still running a system on crashes. Why we say that is that we are currently managing schools by compliance, just making people follow directions and instructions. We are so obsessed with the academics. We tend to push schools for performance. That is why we introduce workbooks. We deal with question banks, common tests. We pile learners with homeworks. And, and we even script lessons for professionals. We push learners to do easy subjects, and we always teach to the test. With this current situation, we, we just are producing job seekers and not people that cre can create jobs. If we are to move, we need to move away from this expectation of high scores from every learner. And, and if we can try to introduce the issues of critical thinking, problem solving, innovation in our teaching. I, I, I'm not calling for the change of curriculum. What I'm saying is that the very same curriculum that we are teaching, we need to begin to ask ourselves, what else do I need to add? How differently must I teach? How differently must I assess learners so that these elements of critical thinking, problem solving, and innovation become embedded in the education that you're giving to the children so that they don't become that dependent? We need to be aiming post COVID to produce this product a confident person who has a strong sense of right and wrong. We need to have young people that are adaptable and resilient. Those who know themselves and are discerning in judgment, think independently and critically and communicate effectively. With the type of following instructions, we may not be able to produce that type of a learner. We're looking for self-directed learners who question, reflect, persevere, and take responsibility for their own learning. You could see the damage that COVID has, has created because we still don't have learners that, that are responsible and can also take responsibility for their learning. We need an active contributor who's able to work effectively in teams, is innovative, exercises initiative, take calculated risk and strive for excellence. We're looking for concerned citizens who are rooted to the country who have a strong sense of civic responsibility, who are informed about the country and the world and take active part in bettering their lives and the lives of others. I don't have to remind you of the incidents that happened in KZN and, and in Houting, where we, we, we suddenly became people who burn resources, people who loot, is because the product that we're aiming for is that product that is geared on producing high scores instead of the skills that I've, I've mentioned here. When you look at what you see on the screens, ethics and base, as basic principles, integrity, responsibility, the respect of laws and regulations, these are what make successful and rich countries what they are. Countries are successful because they live by those principles. And unless we educate our children to live by those principles, we will forever remain a third world country. These countries are rich not because they have resources. We have plenty of resources, the diamonds, the gold, the platinum, you name them, we have them. But because these principles that are indicated on your screen are something that is foreign to us, including the love for work, including punctuality and be, being productive, we will forever remain there. So if we want to think of a positive, uh, a, a post-COVID era, it should be that era where when we teach whatever curriculum we have, we have to instill these things in, in, in our learners. 
This has implications for principals. At the moment, I said they are just following instructions as they are. That is why you find schools closing and opening every time there's a COVID case and principals don't even know what to do because they are waiting for that circuit manager to deliver an instruction instead of them thinking what to do next. That is why principals don't even know what rotational timetable have to be implemented, whether it's a weekly or it's a day by day, or whether they're going to bring children on a weekly basis and so on, because they are used to be given instruction. But if you look at it in this way that nobody can instruct a school what timetable to follow because each school is unique. The number of children are different. The environment is different. The infrastructure is different. So had we empowered our principals to have that autonomy, to be able to decide what works in their school and work with the teachers in the school, then there will be better principal who will be able to prepare children better. Somebody says, teaching children is like hunting birds. If you shoot where they are, you'll miss them. You have to shoot where they're going in order to catch them. The problem is that we are presently preparing our children for a world that no longer exists. And we have to equip them for a world that is unknown at the moment. I think that Americans call it a VUCA moment. We need principals that are able to adapt their views and even their vision and principals that will be able to have a different and an open mindset and be able to embrace these changes. So what are we calling for? We're calling for principals post-COVID who, who will be able to have this borderless exchange of knowledge. It's not only the South African knowledge that will help us survive COVID and post-COVID. It's about what is happening all over the world and the lessons that we learn throughout the world. So we need that open-mindedness. We need to be intersectoral in our approach. We can't have that myopic vision and only focus on ourselves as traditions and religions that pertains to this country alone. Interdependence is required here. To quote Norma Russia, bring in the unions there, bring in the teachers, bring in civil society, bring in everybody, because what happens in a school affects the community as a whole as we prepare our children for a future that we don't know how it's going to look like. We need to have changing mindsets and multicultural views in order to survive in the post-COVID era. That collective wisdom is needed from everybody, from the educated and the uneducated. We need to have these shared values of responsibility, of love, of being accountable, being tolerant. And this is the only way we can move South Africa forward so that children grow up knowing how to be responsible. So that if anybody influences them and take them to a wrong direction, they're able to stand up and say, this is not the way to go. And this is the future that we need to protect. So all I'm calling for is a post-COVID era where autonomy is given to schools and where schools are able to bring this product that we're looking for, the product that will withstand any uncertainty that, that, that comes and be able to drive the agenda of education, whether schools are closed or not, but children who love education and who are driven will be able to survive in this uncertainty. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Mr. Ndleba, for that very informative uh, presentation. You know, what resonates with me is, you know, when you alluded to, we knew, we, to the fact that, you know, uh, we are too caught up in a scores-driven uh, education system. And we really need to move away from this so that, you know, we can develop key skills in our learners such as critical thinking, creativity, and self-directed learning. 
Uh, yes, I agree with you. Those are very important skills and it has implications for the work of school leaders post the pandemic. And also, I like the bit you touched on about school autonomy and principal autonomy. But once again, you know, it comes to the question, you know, how do we develop principles for this autonomy? How do we develop the professional capital of school principals post the pandemic so that autonomy can be realized? I think we need to have more conversations around this. So let's move on to our third presenter. I now introduce to you Ms. Landy Diamond. Ms. Diamond is a former school principal and is currently district director in the Western Cape Education Department. She is an executive member of the South African Principals Association, Western Cape Branch, and deputy president of the Education Management Association of South Africa. Recently, she won the National Teaching Award for Excellence in Primary School Education. Ms. Diamond, over to you. Thank you so much, Prof, for that um, beautiful introduction. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, Tolly, if you may uh, pop up my presentation on the screen, please. Thank you so much, um, Tolly. Uh, let's put it on presentation mode. Great. Um, basically, um, as the introduction has already indicated, I am going to share um, my experiences. My presentation is rather looking at practice other than mostly um, research. Um, I'm going to speak looking at this presentation through the lens of my experience as a school principal in the Western Cape and as the district director, next slide, in, in, in the Western Cape as well. So I have experienced um, the management of COVID-19 um, using both aspects as principal and being uh, obviously a, a district director in the district. Thank you. Uh, what I want to do, um, I'm looking at these experiences. Um, we, um, as the previous speakers have alluded, we're looking at COVID-19, the pre-COVID phase, and now we are looking into what is going to happen. We are projecting for the post-COVID um, uh, world in schooling. So when I want to look at that, I want to call this current situation that we are in the zone of proximal dysfunction. And I want to conceptualize it as the theoretical region occupied by public schools in South Africa. And it is the space between the pre-COVID status and the post-COVID schooling. That is what principals and other members of the SMT know, understand, interpret, and appropriate in terms of policies, procedures, regulatory frameworks, SOPs from the government and other authorities to appropriately manage COVID-19 at their institutions as well as the lack of resources at some of the schools, anxiety that comes with the challenges and the pressures the educational leaders face without any orientation to the unprecedented post-COVID world we are talking about this afternoon. Then we look at the procedural processes and interpretation of the relevant rules, regulations, code of conduct that will be needed at the time. This lack of grounded understanding of managing COVID-19 holistically at our schools and the chaos caused thereafter often lead to challenging situations where principals find themselves having to lead in an adaptive way. And in turn, this holds the potential for possibly detrimental consequences, such as in the case of curriculum management, for an example, where the acquisition of core competences can be compromised. Next slide. So the purpose of this presentation, obviously we're looking at uh, 
imagining the future of schooling in this country. And we do know that um, South Africa is not in isolation. Over 190 countries worldwide had to close and open schools at different times, responding to the pandemic. We want to look at the current impact on classrooms, school leadership and governance and school communities. Next slide. When I look about these challenges, um, the, the sector has been challenged at different levels where schools had to balance the home activities besides the on-site activities that are happening in terms of curricular management. And the surge in cases, which is still the case in many provinces, it's also deepening complexity and uncertainty at schools. There are quite a number of gaps in teaching and learning. If we look, for instance, at the foundation phase, our grade nines of, of last year, they haven't been our grade ones of last year, and the grade tens for that matter, starting the, the, the exit phase, they haven't been exposed to um, a proper schooling. So if you are looking at next year, they will be entering the exit grade without having been exposed to proper schooling. So therefore, throughout the system, there are gaps. We are then faced with the kind of teacher that we need to work with, the leaders and the communities that we need to work with in managing this pandemic. Next slide. I'm now, these challenges that we have, we're seeing them as the eye openers, loss of learning and the paralyzed education system, the staff capacity and skills, as I alluded to earlier, requires an adaptive leader. So all these things that I've listed here are actually eye openers. There were some challenges in the system before. I think COVID-19 has just brought them to the fore. Now, if we are looking at this, we still have institutions. We still have to realize their vision, regardless of the, of the challenges that we have. They still have a value proposition that they need to do. Now, post-COVID schooling impact. We also need to look at the quality of the metric graduates that we are producing during this period and post this period, because all these children that are missing schooling are our potential matriculants of the time. There's a lot of anxiety for job placement as fewer study opportunities are also happening abroad. These are some of the challenges that um, we are actually faced with and we want to use COVID-19, next slide, as a catalyst for change. Now, embracing these challenges that we are faced with, we can decide either to stand and complain, or we can either realize that we cannot swim against the current, we need to do something about the current situation. Good governance and management during this time are a tantamount to the constitutional mandate of providing education in the case of our province, which is the Western Cape, for instance, which is the realization of quality education for every child in every school in the province. So while we are talking about that, there's a broad range of processes that are required pertaining to what constitutes an effective post-COVID schooling in South Africa. The core function of schools and the acquisition of core competencies should be at the forefront of preparing for the post-COVID schooling. Instead of focusing on everything else, we need to zoom in and find out what is it that these children need to acquire in order to move to the next grade and focus and come together as curriculum specialists and educational leaders to see what is it that these children need to learn in order to go to the next grade and centralize that kind of, of thinking. Next slide. We have a, a mandate of, um, obviously we know that we need to get all our children back into the schooling ultimately. Next slide. As much as we have that, um, that's the UNESCO mandate. We also have our own national and provincial mandates. Now we need to bridge the gap while we are realizing that mandate and emerge stronger than we had before. Looking at issues of prevention, control and containment phase. If we don't look at prevention, we will not get a post COVID state in South Africa because the situation will just deepen and worsen. We need to ensure that our educational managers are managing the spread of COVID-19 appropriately, and we are at the forefront of the advocacy. Issues of psychosocial support for both learners and staff need to be taken into cognizance. I've already spoken into the key competencies. And we also look at the kind of assessment that we are assessing at schools, which should literally just zoom into what skills need to be acquired in order to manage as the children progress through schooling. 
the role of the principal cannot be overemphasized and the role of the district director and the district as a whole in supporting schools through this process is also of critical importance in terms of um, rolling up our sleeves and holding the schools as we navigate through this period. We will finally get to a leapfrog moment where we will see innovation, opportunity to identify new strategies and to ultimately contribute positively to our education system. Next slide. Some of the lessons learned from the current waves that we have and elsewhere are looking at the research, although I'm more looking at the practical side of things, looking at the Chinese education policy, for instance. And interestingly, uh, it said that the virus started in China and they were only affected for the 2020 academic year. China has had a smooth schooling this year and they are not even wearing masks at this stage and they are back to normal and they have a centralized and unified system. And if we can learn from countries like that and have all provinces pulling together, strengthening our school and parent collaborations, and also giving more attention to our areas that are disadvantaged and rural areas. And support our schools as we move and try to master blended learning and make use of the lessons learned to better our schools by being proactive rather than reactive and prioritizing the training of governors. For instance, um, the governing bodies have a critical role to play in terms of um, taking the schools to the next level. And this does not necessarily imply a lack of provisioning on the part of the department in terms of offering training to the school management and government. But on the contrary, different schools are at different levels of maturity to manage this virus. So both the provincial departments and the districts do offer training and guidance, but this training needs to be expanded to be more comprehensive and far more extensive than the current practices. For this to happen, the role and importance of orientation and training for school leaders require rethinking in order to redress the divide between what other schools do to manage and the rest of those who are not always compliant. Next slide. So post-COVID implementation implications rather for school leaders, we will need leaders who are strong to strengthen governance at public schools and also to amend our policies so that we can plan with the disaster in mind. So we can use this opportunity to learn whether it's COVID or not. So we are not reactive, rather proactive in managing our institutions. More teacher development is an indication of a need at this stage and also learner management, because you will be working with learners who have not only lost gaps through the curriculum, but who might be wounded in terms of being affected or infected by the virus. Adhering to basic compliance protocols is very critical. A simple example is wearing of a mask properly at, a, at an educational institution can take us a long way in terms of managing and getting um, away from this COVID-19 targeted teaching plans and also interrogate the content and skills that are required for us to master and get our learners to be up to date. Next slide. So um, in closing, I want to say that uh, draw on the um, school leadership and management volume that school leaders on this journey are defined by their determination hope and their unshakable belief that whatever happens, whatever the cause, whatever the scale of the challenge, they will continue to do everything in their power to safeguard the learning of young people. Next slide. And in closing, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, a mind that has been stretched to a new idea never goes back to its original dimensions. I'm hoping that everybody that has attended this webinar today will take some take home basket and put in the bags and go and contextualize what has been learned here to better their institutions. Everything of the best, stay safe and wear your mask and sanitize. Thank you. That's Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Diamond for that presentation. In fact, I was quite intrigued by your zone of proximal dysfunction. Yes, you know, uh, you raise an important, uh, you know, point about, you know, shifting focus 
on what needs to be done to get uh, children to progress. And of course, you flag an important issue that we need strong uh, you know, leaders to uh, you know, ensure that vision of getting learners to progress post the pandem pandemic. Uh, up next is uh, Professor Vitalis Chikoko. Prof Chikoko is Professor of Education Leadership at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He's a prolific international scholar with a number of publications to his name. Further, he has uh, affiliations to several professional learning communities, both nationally and internationally. Professor Chikoko, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. I uh, am used to teaching uh, three hour lectures and uh, Professor Naika is asking me to say something sensible in eight minutes. Uh, that's a big ask, Prof. But anyway, I will try. I want to thank uh, colleagues who have presented before me. They, they bring very noble ideas. Ms. Talusa raises a very important issue about the need for attending to mental health. And Ms. Sangeve raises the very important thing about the need to take a multi-stakeholder approach to things. And, uh, and uh, Ms. Diamond raises what I think uh, will resonate very closely with my presentation, the, the need for focusing on core competencies. Um, I'm just touching on a few issues that come on board. I have um, I have entitled uh, my presentation as follows, a call for a shift from deficit to asset-based approaches. The deficit approach to issues is where an organization says, we cannot do this because we don't have this, we don't have that, we don't have that. Leave us alone, we can't do this. The asset-based approach is one that says, okay, we don't have this, we don't have that. But let's look inside ourselves and see if there are things that we can draw from. What assets do we have to start? We are not going to fold our hands and say, because we don't have this, because we don't have that, therefore we can't move. Now, this thinking, this approach, this uh, philosophy is uh, uh, attributed to Kretzmann and McKnight, 1993, but I want to use them to challenge the deficit approach to say, it's not going to help us to continue to say we don't have this, we don't have that, we don't have this, and therefore we are not as good as others. So I want to present around schools in Quindals one to three of this country. These are schools that are the most disadvantaged, the schools that do not have much in terms of resources. The schools that probably will sit in the comfort zone of um, they we don't have this, that we don't have that. So I have um, the first bullet here. I will not talk about it. Ms. Kaluza has already touched on this. I was going to, to say a bit about the need for us to really study the traumas and the impacts that COVID has caused. That has been touched. So I want to touch on three things. Back to basics, digitization, and time use. Those are the three things that I'll attempt to touch on. When we 
enter a classroom or a school, there are there is one or two things that are important in a school, helping learners to learn and helping learners to learn how to learn. And I want to argue that in most cases, in my experience as a teacher, we tend to dwell on number one and tend to do less on number two, helping learners to learn how to learn. And I want to argue that one of the reasons why things stopped completely in most schools when, when COVID arrived, when schools, when societies were de-schooled, what happened was that learning completely stopped for most children, particularly in Quindell's one to three schools. And I want to argue that one of the major reasons is because the, there is the absence of item two. These learners, we have not helped them to learn how to learn on their own or with minimum assistance. Granted, we cannot rule out the issue of resources and so on and so on, but to what extent are our children able to learn how to learn? So the elephant in the room in as far as many South African schools is concerned, low literacy and numerous levels. And here is some of the evidence. Almost 75% of learners in grade seven are unable to perform basic mathematical operations. Now, when I, when I read this, I hoped that things would have changed. But if you look at uh, sources that come later here, uh, 2020, things don't seem to have changed. About 78% of grade four children cannot read for many. And so you have large number of children who do not learn to read for meaning in the early years of schooling. And this is systemic in most disadvantaged schools. Now, my argument is that if children are not able to attain adequate literacy and numeracy, we are not going anywhere. We are going nowhere slowly. And as far as I'm concerned, this is a social injustice. We can't do anything else if we don't deal with this. And uh, uh, Mr. Gebe, Ms. Taluza, uh, Ms. Diamond, I hope you will tell me that things have now changed in schools. If they haven't, we are causing social injustice. And so I want to argue that we must go back to that. Every school must up its game in terms of raising the literacy and numerous levels of children. What is it that we have? What are the assets that are available here? The children themselves. These children we are talking about with low literacy and numerous levels are teachable. There's nothing wrong with the children. They are as good as other children elsewhere who have high literacy and numerous levels. The second thing I want to talk about is digitization. This is basically to say, let's use technology to enhance teaching and learning. Now the deficit thinking again is very rich, is very high in this case. The Quintel one to three schools will tell us that what are you talking about? We don't have anything. How can you talk about digitization? I am aware of that, but I'm still saying we are not giving space for the asset-based approach. What is it that we have? Of course, we must, we must be very clear that technology has become a fundamental construct in education in the 21st century. And, uh, it is actually a fact that uh, in some cases, we are dealing with uh, children who we can call digital natives, children who can play around with gadgets and perform miracles. The fourth industrial revolution has arrived and there's no going back about it, but I argue that 
The fourth industrial revolution does not have to intimidate us because it should not mean the same thing for every school or for every child. What assets do we have in Quindell's one to three schools? I want to argue that almost every household in this country has got a cell phone, a cell phone that can send and receive WhatsApp messages. And I put in the last bullet here, I give, I give you evidence that WhatsApp can be used for productive learning. These children send WhatsApp to one another, but what has happened, the deficit situation has said, cell phone is a no-no in every school. Why? Because when we have cell phones, what is going to happen? When they get stolen, who's going to answer? When uh, these children communicate negatively, who's going to answer? So we remain in the deficit situation, in the deficit thinking. Yes, those things must be considered. But what is the asset side of things? How much can we leverage by a mere cell phone? I've just given an example of a cell phone. There could be other, other gadgets. And so we are not going to go anywhere if we remain in the deficit model. Time is the scarcest resource. And unless it is managed, nothing else can be managed. And uh, in South Africa, Taylor is a South African writer. He says, no resource is more poorly utilized in South African schools than time. So you and me in South Africa, we sometimes think, behave as if we have the keys to the sun that we can lock it and uh, it will stand there while we do whatever we want. And when we want it to move, it will move. There's nothing like that. Here is a study that uh, a colleague of mine and myself conducted recently. This is a 2021 publication. We studied six principals, school principals, in terms of their perspectives and experiences of how they utilize time. And our findings are suggesting that there are two types of school principals. One, we, the group that we have called the perspiring principal, reactive, overwhelmed, firefighting, running around like headless chicken. And the end result is that they are always stressed and largely unproductive. That's how they use time. They really struggle with. Then we have the inspiring principal in charge, proactive, visionary, and, 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 and such principal is largely productive. The point I'm raising here is that time does not wait for anybody. Every minute in that school campus matters. But the way we use time, you and me, suggests that we, we, we own the sun, but we don't. I want to conclude by saying what an organization does or fails to do during times of no crisis as a strong bearing on its success or failure during the crisis. It's not so much what we do during a crisis, but it's much about what we do when the crisis has not arrived. What building blocks are we putting in place? And of course, we must remember that COVID is not going to be the last crisis. So I call for what I am calling liberation school leadership, where the school shifts from concentrating on teaching to facilitating self-directed learning, which is what I think we require because um, we have kind of remained for too long in helping learners to learn, but forgetting that we must also help them to learn how to learn. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Chikoko. A interesting perspective on the asset-based approach 
uh, self-directed learning. And of course, towards the end, you know, you packaged it all under, you know, liberation school leadership as a way forward. Uh, you know, just as an advert or a commercial, uh, in the forthcoming special issue of the peer-reviewed journal Alternations, uh, Prof. Chikoko unpacks in greater detail some of the issues he mentioned here uh, today, more so around uh, you know, the asset-based approach, self-directed learning, and uh, uh, you know, liberation school leadership. So you know, this is just a heads up to you. Uh, look out for this journal if you want to read more around this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I now hand over to our final presenter for the afternoon, uh, Professor Raj Mestri. Uh, Prof. Mestri is Emeritus Professor of Education Leadership at the University of Johannesburg. He has extensive teaching experience in higher education and is a National Research Foundation rated researcher. He has published extensively nationally and internationally in peer-reviewed journals and books, and is a recipient of several national research awards. Professor Mestri, I hand over to you. Prof. Mestri, I think you might need to unmute. Oh, thank you very much. I just want to share my screen now. Uh, this is the one I've... Okay, there we are, but I need to get to the top one. Okay. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Naika, for the introduction. I entitled my presentation here, Reorientation and Reinvention of School Leadership in Post-COVID-19. But I must say, Che, when you are the last speaker, then everybody has covered your topic. And technically, I shouldn't be continuing now with my presentation. For example, Ms. Kaluza talked about inequalities, especially with budget issues, and also talked about the timetable issues as well. So that falls under what I'm going to be talking about in terms of instructional leadership. Mr. Indlebe also talks about instructional leadership. And what he brings is an important point, which I'm going to be raising as well, is compliant leadership. And you find that principals don't know what to do when a situation arises. And then Ms. Landeka Diamond, she brings in an important perspective and talks about crisis versus opportunity and also raises the issue around competence. And that chair is what I talk about in terms of crisis leadership or crisis leadership and change management. Then comes Professor Chikoko, who really then takes all aspects of my paper and then begins to talk about the deficit, uh, uh, to convert deficit to an asset-based approach. And you'll find that I'm going to be referring to the entrepreneurial leadership as well. So, and he brings in an interesting point when he talks about the perspiring principle versus the inspirational principle. So my topic then is around these that have already been alluded to. So I may uh, leave, skip some of my slides if I think it's not really necessary so that I could then begin to explore other aspects. So my topic is more about the role of school principals. But may I say something here, that if the audience is not a principal, if the if people in the audience are not principals, this is not something that's going to be irrelevant to them because all they have to do is put themselves in a, a managerial position or a leadership position. And the question they would ask is, how do I deal with these issues? So I, while my topic is about principles, principalship as such, but it also has relevance to all school management team members, as well as to teachers as well. 
So I, I start off with an important point by saying that many principles are not functioning at the optimum. And as Professor Chikoko has mentioned, uh, the results are, are, are poor in our schools. And that is probably one of the reasons, chief reasons, why our learners do not perform well. Now, even though the Department of Education has professional development programs for principals and even for teachers, it's usually a one-size-fits-all approach and has very little benefits for the uh, participants as such. And what I'm arguing here as well, that the time has come when we no longer can be learning on the job or applying common sense to complex problems. Because what is important to understand that the criteria to become a school principal is really a very, very, uh, the, it's, it's something that's not stringent enough. So that anybody who has just about seven years of teaching experience and doesn't even have to move from head of department to deputy principal, then to principal, we find this kind of situation being critical in the performance of our learners. Now, this is from anecdotal uh, evidence. I haven't been able to do any real research on this here, but we find that principals struggle to react quickly and adequately to the ever-changing demands of COVID-19. And this was very, very uh, nicely put by Mr. Indlebe, who talks about when a situation arises that they don't know what to do. And this is what I'm arguing as well, that because they are so used to this compliant leadership that they wait for, for, for instructions or they wait for guidance, uh, and then they are able to take some decisions. I'm, and I'm arguing the time has come now for principals to have autonomy. And I think this was also raised by uh, uh, Ms. Diamond as well, that there should be autonomy for principals as well. They cannot manage change during the crisis. And there the issue around finding it difficult to ba balance the budgets. And these are the context, the COVID-19 context. And it's gonna be here for a while and it's gonna have an impact even though we have a post-COVID situation. So what I'm advocating is that there must be professional development for principals. And when I say for principals, I'm also uh, referring to school management teams, and I'm also referring to teachers as well. And I want to focus on three important issues here. Instructional leadership, entrepreneurial leadership, and crisis leadership and management. These are three things that, have uh, that are so important and has come to the fore for our schools to be managed or to be led effectively. So let's just basically look at why I talk about instructional leadership. In other words, principals were caught flat-footed, unable to deal with the situation when COVID emerged. They need to learn how to deal with disruptions. In other words, the situation where parents are reluctant to send the children to school, how to use uh, different platforms for online teaching, helping teachers in their preparation during the disruptions, designing online learner assessments and rotational timetabling that was mentioned earlier as well. And what we're saying is in this instructional leadership development programs, they, they should be blended learning that should be accentuated. And here I'm arguing the point that teachers have to become proficient in technology in digital literacy and online teaching, which Professor Chikoko had mentioned. Now, in terms of entrepreneurial leadership, and here I want to argue also again what Professor Chikoko has talked about in terms of the asset-based model that he's talking about when we talk about deficits. You know, for, we are now over 27 years into democracy. And every time we are making excuses when our learners are not performing well, our schools are not performing well. And the question that, that begs of the situation is, why? Why is it so that 
in terms of funding, the funding model that the government has introduced has definitely addressed social justice and equity. That schools are getting substantial funding, but what is happening is that many of the schools are highly dependent on that money. They are unable to become entrepreneurs. And what I'm not saying that they must be business people. No, I'm not arguing for that. I'm saying that they've got to become innovative. They've got to be creative. They've got to be thinking of ways and different opportunities of raising funds so that we should not be just talking about there's no resources in our school. I, I, I don't buy that. I don't buy that at all. I believe that school leaders have the potential of, for, of raising the, the standards of their school by becoming creative and innovative. So that they need training. They need training and, and development in, in terms of their own abilities, in terms of their own attitudes, in terms of their own motivational levels. So entrepreneurship is so important in this day and age, especially in the 21st century. And this is why, and I don't mean to, 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 to undermine, but you'll find that there are many schools, many schools from disadvantaged communities who are beginning to improve. And the reason for that is they have strong leadership. And that is what I'm arguing for is strong leadership. The other aspect of leadership that I also talk about is crisis leadership. In fact, I must be honest with you, at this point in time, if I was going to be asked to, to, to lead and manage a school, I would have serious problems because I am not even trained in terms of cri uh, crisis situations. And we've got to learn, we've got to be, we, and we've got to give, we've got to develop our principals, our school leaders, our teachers to deal with crisis. And this is what I'm arguing for in terms of professional development, that the, the communication should be effective and speedily. They should be facilitating sense making in conditions of uncertainty, learning to be flexible and adaptive, paying attention to the emotional well-being and health of employees that was mentioned also by one of the speakers as well. And that's what I'm arguing about is that our principals, our school leaders have to become, uh, uh, they should be able to lead in a crisis situation. Now, some of the attributes of leadership uh, in, in terms of crisis leadership is the ability to cope with extraordinary circumstances, the capacity to think laterally and on the spur of the moment, the preparedness to respond flexibly and quickly and to change directions rapidly if required. And more important, which was also brought in by Professor Chikoko, the resilience to persevere when all seems to be lost. And then more importantly, and this is what I always want to argue about, a willingness to take necessary risks and to break the rules when the situation deems it necessary. People, this is a serious problem that we have in our schools. Our leaders are not prepared to take risks. They are, they, all they do is they comply to the regulations, to the legislations, to policies, and this is how they then lead their schools. And there's no way you can move a school from a mediocre or low levels to a high performing school. It is only through uh, being a creative principle, a principle that can take risks. So in my argument here, I believe that there should be attention devoted to professional learning. And of course, how does this, how, how can one do this? There is the issue around the professional learning communities that were mentioned already, but I also want to advocate the issue around the advanced diploma in education. That is a, 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 a qualification that will help you in dealing with some of these uh, leadership traits that I'm talking about. Finally, Principals can make a significant contribution to schools achieving their educational goals and improving learner performance under post-COVID-19 conditions if they are adequately prepared for their leadership roles. So for principals to cope with the demands of the 21st century, innovative leadership development programs to help prepare school leaders to apply creative approaches to achieve intended outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Mestri, uh, for that very insightful presentation. Uh, you know, 
you trust you know you touched on some interesting perspectives on typologies of leadership you know entrepreneurial leadership uh, crisis leadership uh, compliant leadership uh, instructional leadership and i'm certain when we get uh, you know when we move on next into the question and answer feature some of these typologies and uh, how we implement them in practice uh, will feature uh, you know, I've been monitoring the uh, chat as well as the Q&A, and there's been some healthy engagement uh, on both the, the chat and uh, also a number of questions uh, raised in the Q&A feature. Unfortunately, you know, in terms of the time available to us, uh, we won't be, it won't be possible for us uh, to go through all the questions. However, we'll engage you know, with a sample of the questions. And yeah, I'm going to ask, you know, the panel to try and answer some of the questions uh, that have been posed. Uh, you know, the first one was a question that was sent to, you know, to us by via email. And uh, it was a question that was posted by, uh, posted by, uh, by Dudu Malatsa. And uh, the question is around this, you know, it's a social justice question. And uh, I'd like the uh, panel members to take note of this. You know, the question is, how do we address the inequality among learners post COVID-19, where learners may have to embark on online teaching in public schools. I think uh, what she's alluding to is more uh, the blended pedagogies, blended ap approaches to teaching and learning. But also linked to that, there was another question that came through. And uh, I'm gonna merge both the questions because the other question is also linked to issues of social justice. And it goes something like this. Post COVID, a new form of colonization will confront schools, that of digital colonization. How can school leaders protect the vulnerable from further being disadvantaged through the introduction of technology in teaching and learning? So I think it's a very interesting question. I mean, how, you know, how do we ensure equity in you know, when you bring in issues of technology. So let's get the panel to engage with that. And if I may ask, you know, uh, can I ask, for example, you know, Prof Chikoko, just to give us a start. And thereafter, you know, if I could also get uh, a teacher union perspective after Prof Chikoko to get uh, Ms. Kaluza to respond. And then, to get uh, the a Department of Basic Education view, uh, maybe we get Mr. Endlever to respond. So in that order, I think we'll take uh, three of the presenters, presenters to respond, Prof. Chikoko, uh, Ms. Kaluza, and uh, uh, Mr. Endlever. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, we have to put facts on the ground. One, Technology is here to stay. Whether we are going to be disadvantaged or not, the importance of technology is not going to go away. Okay, that's, that's one. Two, in one of my slides, I indicated that technology should not mean the same thing for every school, for every child. Technology in our school in the rural area does not necessarily have to mean the same kinds of things, the same kinds of gadgets that a school in a fortified situation in a rich community is going to do. And having said that, if we put into our mind frames to say, we are going to participate in this technology, but we will start from where we can start. 
let us look around and see what is possible for ourselves. We will accept that we are not going to be the same with anyone else. But if our minds are preoccupied with issues of, yes, of course, government must assist us. Yes, of course, we must talk about differences. Yes, of course, there must be ways of balancing things. But while those debates are continuing, what are we doing in our own schools? Are we waiting to say things must improve? Or are we trying with what we have? So the, 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 the basic message I'm giving is to say, technology is not going to wait for anybody, but let technology be interpreted the way we can afford in our own context moving forward. If, if another school is faster than us, fine. The differences that were created in the 40 odd years of apartheid are not going to, to be leveled in, uh, in, in a few years. I think the trouble is that we are too preoccupied with the deficit model to say we are disadvantaged, there's nothing we can do. And uh, somebody must come from somewhere to do things for us. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Chikoko. Uh, Ms. Kaluza? Thank you, thank you, Prof. <clears throat> for me, I, I, I think, unfortunately, um, we're not going to go back. Uh, fourth Industrial Revolution is, is here. And in fact, other countries are, have gone um, to, to the fifth one. So I fully agree with Prof Chikoko that um, technology is here and, and um, our schools have to, to adapt. But most importantly, on, on social justice, as, um, as, uh, as the question seems to be, I think what is more important, because we're not going to, to ignore the, rea the realities that are obtaining currently in terms of inequalities, even on, on, on technology, as well as uh, what I said in the, in the slides in my presentation, the digital divide that is uh, obtaining. What is more important is to now focus more on equity than equality, so that uh, you are able to, to even lift those that are at the bottom. I think for me, if we are for social justice, which uh, our, our constitution talks about, the issue of equity will have to come up um, and, and then be followed by equality. But um, as, as I've said, Prof, we're not going to go back. And by the way, if I can use uh, some, some seconds, by the way, teachers themselves, as, as we know that they are always innovative, during the, the, the lockdowns, without being pushed, without being told, but they started to prepare lessons for their learners using the what's happened other ways. But the issue, again, is the issue of infrastructure challenges in communities. Again, it will talk to issues of equity. How to address that? Because you understand that the schools are not the same in South Africa. Others are still far behind, whilst others can do on their own and can stand on their own. So that is that that I can say, Prof, we can't go, but what is imp we can't go back. What is more important as we move towards the fourth industrial revolution, the issue of context is very important so that we don't have a situation where you bring something that will not be useful for and, and not effective for a particular context. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kaluza. Uh, Mr. Ndleba? Thank you very much, Chairperson. Can, can, can I give you this example? I think it was four years, five years back when I visited rural schools in KZN during our monitoring. And when you ask them for an email address, they will definitely say, we don't have. That included principals and teachers. There were no email addresses there. Then I said to them, I need you to email me the following documents. 
And within two weeks from now on, I need you to have created your own email address in your own phone. I need you to have used the school budget to budget for a time and data for you to be able to do that because money is there in the school. It's just that you're not prioritizing this. You're not seeing it as something very important. And I can report now that there is no school without an email address, whether it's a personal email address or something. What I'm trying to indicate here is it's a matter of priority sometimes. If we really believe in the nanny state that government is going to provide everything for us, it might not happen. But if schools can begin a reprioritizing type of a situation where we train our SGBs that whatever funding you're getting from government, try and, and indicate where the need of utilizing those funds is. Uh, during the COVID era, we're not playing sports. So there's a lot of savings. There are things that are not happening. What happens to the money that we're not using? Some schools will be using it for choral music and all those things. They are not happening. We can, as Professor Chikoko has said, step by step, class by class, we may be able to do something. And the beginning might be to have Wi-Fi at, at the administration block. The next thing, what we extend it, because more and more children are getting access to telephones. More and more children are on WhatsApp and all these type of things. So it, it, it's a matter of the willpower. It's a matter of being independent and autonomous to be able to take your own decisions and work with your SGBs and redirect money to where it is needed most. Within a matter of time, we may not be talking about connectivity in those schools that are struggling. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Endleber, for that input. Uh, let's move on. Uh, here's another very interesting question. Uh, you know, it is only in times of great disruption and change, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, that opportunities to remake and imagine new forms of equitable, equitable education and school leadership emerge. And, you know, this is a, uh, in a little quotation from Nasir and Bang. And, you know, recent scholarship calls for resilient leadership, distributed leadership, courageous leadership. And uh, as uh, Professor Mestri mentioned, entrepreneurial leadership, crisis leadership, compliant leadership, instructional leadership. Uh, so, you know, given these range of uh, leadership models, typologies, et cetera, you know, how do school leaders actually put into practice uh, these different forms of leadership, you know, to transform their schools and of course, to transform schooling as well. And uh, I don't know whether, you know, Prof Mestri, if you uh, want to just engage with some of these uh, models and types of leadership and, uh, how they can be operationalized, how they can be put into practice. And more so, you know, we now adopt a more expensive approach to school leadership. You know, rather seeing leadership as position, you know, we also see leadership as practice. So in this broad, expensive type of school leadership, how do all these different uh, uh, models of leadership uh, you know, how do they feature? How can they be put into practice? Uh, Prof. Mestri, if you can just speak to that a little, and also thereafter, if we could have Ms. Diamond. Uh, Prof. Mestri? Okay, thanks. Thank you, uh, Professor Naika. Uh, the, 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 valid, the valid point that is being made by the, by the, by the participant here, is something that cannot be answered in, in, in five minutes or 10 minutes, but I can just sort of encapsulate some of the important issues. I'm of the opinion that 
a person who's given a leadership position or a managerial position is so crucial for the upliftment of education in that community, as well as for the learners more specifically. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm arguing the point that the person, is, and now you're bringing the principal again, but I'm not only gonna be uh, highlighting the principal, what I'm saying is that the principal takes that stance. In other words, by working collaboratively with other stakeholders, the principal will be able to achieve a number of difficult situations. It's through collaboration. It's actually getting the stakeholders to take ownership of the school. Or, and, 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 to, and in, in the way it must be done is that it mustn't be seen that one person is running a school or one person makes all the decisions, that there should be a shared vision. So what I'm arguing is, firstly, that the appointment of people onto school leadership is so critical that in the case of, of and I'll just give you an example, in, in, in Finland, to become a teacher, you must have a master's degree. In other words, if you don't have a master's degree, you cannot be a teacher. And I'm saying in the same way, we must have criteria to appoint people into school leadership positions who are who, who, who deserve it, who have, they, they should be merit in appointing them. People who have gone through the ranks of being a teacher, being a head of department, being a deputy principal and so forth. So, we have a serious problem in the way we appoint principals and the way we appoint school leaders as such. So what I'm arguing for is it's through collaboration. There is no one style of leadership that someone is gonna become successful in, in leading and managing a school. No, 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 no. That would be wrong to say, only use a democratic style of leadership. That doesn't work. It's gotta be situational leadership dependent on the type of situation you work. And that's why we're calling for, in a case like this, uh, with, uh, and I'm not going to belabor this point, but that first question that was raised about equity, I'm still of the opinion that the school leaders can make the difference. That the time has come where they should not be waiting for, for, for uh, resources, but that they should go out and seek opportunities for this. So this is what, what we are saying, that it's time that they gotta be taking, they gotta be empowered. This is the word I was looking for. They gotta be empowered to make decisions and without being questioned in terms of decisions. And I'm just close this because it's of time. You know, I'm, I've written in some of my articles as well, the Department of Education gives the no fee schools a substantial sum of money, but there's one problem with this. They give them the money and they give conditions to how the money must be spent. This I have a serious problem with because as, uh, as the previous speaker also mentioned uh, in terms of, uh, you know, that schools are given uh, these kinds of opportunities and they must just prioritize. But I'm arguing the point that if they are given the, uh, if, if principals or even school leaders are given the opportunity of spending the money as they deem fit and they make those uh, financial decisions, we're gonna have so much difference in our schools. Why must it every year, they must buy learning and teaching support materials? Why must they be uh, paying for the repairs and maintenance? And why should they be paying for the services? That money could be used to uplift our society. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Mestri. Uh, Ms. Diamond. Um, thanks, Prof. Um, for the question, if I can respond um, to the question that you've raised, um, as mentioned earlier on in my presentation, and I think as alluded by the other speakers as well, we need um, educational leaders that are able to adapt as the situation arises. Um, Okay, I'm just switching on a little here. As the situation arises, we need leaders that can understand um, the vision of this institution that they are leading and the context in, within which they are, they are managing and how best they can bring about 
the best out of the client, which in this case is the child. Um, leadership requires principles that are able to think out of the box and they must be able to think on their feet all the time, be creative and respond to situations without necessarily doing crisis management. So therefore, the principal or an educational leader at any level in the sector needs to plan strategically and address the needs by making use of the different leadership styles that have been mentioned. I'm going to make an example because of time and say, for instance, when we make use of distributed leadership, you one can then use that to delegate um, within the school or the district office, whichever is applicable, make use of that particular leadership style to acquire the desired outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues, uh, for responding to the question. Uh, I note that we are already five minutes over uh, our allocated time. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll just take uh, two more questions and see how best uh, we can respond to that. And then we'll bring this webinar to a close. There's an interesting question here posed by uh, Dr. Sibonello Blose. And uh, he asks, considering that school principals uh, who seem to take a greater portion of expectations, do not undergo much preparation for principalship, how can they be supported to lead schools post the pandemic? And uh, I'd like, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Kaluza and uh, Mr. Endleber to respond to this, but tied in with uh, Dr. Blose's question, uh, there's another interesting question from uh, uh, Ashkelin Governor. And uh, he asks, what structures have been put in place to prepare school leaders to function post COVID in South Africa? I think these are two interesting questions. You know, uh, what are we doing to prepare principals for post COVID schools? So uh, Ms. Kaluza, if uh, you go first and thereafter, Mr. Endleber. Thank you, Prof. Uh, starting with the first one. It is um, uh, true that uh, most of our principals, um, they don't have much to, 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 to offer during these times of crisis. Therefore, <clears throat> the emphasis will be on uh, uh, continuous development of principal skills. And in that, I will fully agree. I think it's Prof. Mestre who suggested that they be taken through um, an advanced diploma, if, if, I, if I, I, I heard him correctly. I think that is important because right now, it, it, it just depends on, 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 on how willing the person is and how capable the person is. But also coupled with that will be the issue of uh, autonomy, including on being able, as suggested by one presenter here, being able to take decisions informed by your own circumstances as the, as the school and form alliances, partnerships as a, as a school principal. In that way, the principal will be able to have platforms to share and uh, get informed and be assisted on how to deal with the most challenges that uh, they find themselves in. In terms of the structures, my observation is that principals are on their own. That, that, that is my view. Principals are on their own because even on the side of the, of, the, of the department, which I believe that it must provide more, you find that they are only convened for, 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 for collecting circulars, taking those circulars to the school and back to the second offices. Structurally, there's nothing. But, but when you come to the teacher unions, you find that in teacher unions like that, you, you, you will have committees of principals where you find that uh, principal seminars get, co that get convened yearly 
where principals at least are assist, but that is not enough. Hence the importance of uh, partnering with schools, even teacher unions partnering with schools and ensuring that um, there are these uh, established uh, committees of principals, the learning communities of principals now, more than those of, uh, of uh, subjects uh, specialists. But if we can have such, and then at the level of the department, they do need to develop structures working together, of course, with other stakeholders. And in that way, that will create a platform for capacity building for our school principal. But most importantly, I fully agree with Prof. Menstry with that uh, approach of Finland and, and other countries, but Finland in particular. I think that South Africa needs to do something, not to, 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 to say before you get appointed. Now that they are here in the system, the department must uh, assist them, but also open up for autonomy in terms of utilizing the, the, the funds that are given to schools so that principals themselves can be able to even attend other developmental sessions on their own through the universities that are nearby. I think, Prof, that is how far I can go in responding to this question. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kaluza. That was quite comprehensive. Uh, Mr. Endleber? Uh, thank you, Prof. You know, the answer lies with how we prepare school leaders. I, I must admit that we, we might be too late for some of our principals now, but that doesn't mean we're giving up on them. But, but we need to come up with, with a system where we really prepare principals in advance. The diploma that is being mentioned by Noma Rashia. It, it, it's a preparatory diploma where we need to prepare the second level to make them ready, that when they take over, they are able to think autonomously, they are able to implement this, change the entire mindset. That, that's the idea of, of the diploma. We, we, we also are working hard to come up with a national induction program, which focuses on the newly appointed principals and take them through a program for the entire year just to make them ready for the job that they, 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 they're taking or where they are appointed. We, we have to work hard with the existing principals in dealing with what we call continuous teacher development, that instead of calling them to these trainings, which sort of create this type of dependency. You need to change the content of what we're training principals on and change their, their mindset. But at the same time, we need to have principals that are really able to take initiatives for themselves. These are issues like unions. I, I, I know all the teacher unions have got now a section where they run teacher development for their own members. We're looking at different associations that principals freely volunteer and, and belong to. Uh, various teacher associations are there in the country, which also assist in, in principals doing their own work themselves. We, we're talking professional learning communities here. So the development of a principal, it's more a personal thing it is also a department that drives a particular agenda. I think SAIS is also playing a very important role. All that it needs is to try and improve its system because SAIS has a responsibility to ensure that people tend to develop themselves and award them what you call CPTD points. So if they can enforce that type of, of, of a system, then we'll have a variety of avenues through which principles can be developed. And in that way, we might close this gap. But the emphasis is really in the preparations of the cohort that is to come and the cohort that has just joined and really show them the right way so that they don't continue on the historic way of running schools. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Endleber, for that input. What's coming through quite uh, you know, clearly uh, from both the inputs, is that we should be giving uh, the advanced diploma in school leadership a shot in the arm. We should be investing more in that uh, in order to develop 
and capacitate uh, school principals. But alongside that, I'm also hearing, you know, closer partnerships uh, between uh, the Department of Basic Education and teacher unions. Also, you know, I think there also needs to be, you know, greater synergy uh, between the Department of Basic Education and uh, higher education institutions. Uh, not necessarily by means of formal qual qualifications, uh, such as the advanced diploma in school leadership, but also I think, uh, you know, uh, running short courses, one day workshops, etc. So I think there needs to be, you know, more conversations around how, you know, we can build synergies between uh, the Department of Basic Education and the Department of Higher Education. I'm conscious that we weigh over time, but we're going to take uh, one more uh, question. And uh, yeah, I'm going to ask, uh, you know, Prof. Chikoko and uh, Professor Mestri to respond. And, uh, you know, the question is, there are strong calls in this webinar to move away from deficit approaches to asset-based approaches to uh, running schools. So the question is, how do we change school leader mindsets to embrace asset-based approaches? How do we go about doing this? Professor Chikoko, if uh, you can start, and uh, thereafter we'll have uh, Professor Mestri. Thank you, Chair. The, the asset-based approach itself will say it shouldn't be too much of somebody going there to change them. It should actually be themselves initiating the change. But the moment we, 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 we come and want to, to go there and change them, uh, Yes, we will have some role to play, those of us who are not in school. But maybe the question, in my view, should be, uh, how can uh, they change? And, uh, and uh, I would say to, to them, they must copy, but they must go back to the basics. They must copy, you know what uh, a baby, what a child who is learning to walk does? They are very courageous, that, those children are very courageous. They will stand up and walk even if they know they are going to fall. And falling is part of the process. So school principals must be courageous to walk paths they have not walked before. In other words, they must try things. And somebody asked it about what, what structures can be put in place Structures are a policy, a function of policy, but what most of us are used to is to say the department is going to come to us and, and change this structure. But there is also another way to say the way we do things can encourage our district office, our provincial office to rethink about structures and we can sell possible new structures by the way we do things. So I would say, let us encourage schools to work among themselves together. There is assets when you group five neighboring schools together and have them begin to cross-pollinate ideas in terms of what is doable among themselves in terms of what it is that they can sell to their district to say the way we look at things in our context is this. And uh, I think Ms. Kaluza uh, talked about context. So I know that there are school clusters, but I'm not sure how workable they are. There is lots of ideas that can come out of schools themselves coming together and addressing their issues. I, I would want to say that uh, this bottom-up approach 
is something that we should encourage. Of course, it depends on the power dynamics. Uh, it depends on how education officials, when they go there, are going to do and, and to what extent they are amenable to those. If the power dynamics are top heavy uh, to the extent that uh, schools and uh, clusters of schools are not given opportunities to craft certain ideas, it might be problematic. Uh, but if they are given th those leeways um, and, and in turn, if the school principals understand that leadership is not the preserve of them in the office, uh, you can have miraculous things happening, being spearheaded by an ordinary teacher in grade one uh, that we can run with as a school. So it must trickle down. So in summary, I am saying, let us allow the schools themselves, let us give them some space to, of course, let's challenge them to do so. You, you might be surprised what comes out of that. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Chikoko. Uh, Prof Mestri? Yeah, I want to concur with uh, Professor Chikoko. Uh, I, and I think uh, just two things before I start with the actual answer. I, I would encourage people to read an article that I've written on empowering uh, principles to lead and manage schools in the 21st century. It's easily accessible. It's an open access in the South African Journal of Education where I then argue the points of how people can become effective school leaders as such. But I want to take a simple example. I don't want to be, you know, I, 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 what happens is when we give so many ideas and, and some of these ideas may not be realistic, but I, I, one thing that is clear in this COVID situation, I've seen and I've read that if you get the community involved, you are, it's unreal the resources that, that community-based schools are. The people are so willing to help. They want their children to be educated and they go all out to ensure that the schools are going to be led and managed effectively and successfully. So I'm calling for to, 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 uh, uh, to resolve this kind of situation is that you make your school a community-based school. In other words, it must not be just the teachers and the principal uh, that must be involved. You also have the broader community would, would want to help as well. So I just give you a simple example. In a school that I was head of department in, for years, and I'm telling you, it still continues, for years, there's been no vandalism at that school. No vandalism at all. And this is how the principal at that time had introduced this idea. He made the school a community-based school. That if anybody got into the school that were not supposed to be, that the community takes charge of it. They, they, would, they would really care for the, for, the, for the school terrain as such. And once a year, the principal and staff will have a function for the, for the community. And it's all sponsored by the school in order to say to the, to the community, we appreciate your involvement in our school. So that's the idea I, I, I'm, I'm calling on, is that even when you're looking at someone with school, sorry, with finances, if the school doesn't have someone that's uh, afraid with school finances, the community members will be there to help. When there are teachers who are absent, community members are called in to assist. So I'm saying this is one way you can make schools effective. But I also want to mention the other thing. You know, and I think Ms. The, 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 the speaker from the department had mentioned this as well, that it's, it's time for principals to get up and to start doing things. In other words, you can't wait for help all the time. You can't wait for support. You must begin to think of how you can help the school. You've got to be creative. And this is what I was talking about in the entrepreneurial uh, leadership. So what I'm saying is that there has to be passion. You know, the person who, 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 who takes on this responsibility of, of running a school or leading a school and managing a school must be someone that is really committed, dedicated to this profession and will want to help. And in this way, you can change the direction of that school. Thank you. 
You know, uh, thank you colleagues, you know, for responding to the questions. You know, uh, I said that that will be the last question that we'll engage in. And we've already, uh, we are already 25 minutes over time. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of this webinar and some very interesting, insightful, uh, as well as uh, maverick uh, perspectives were presented on post-COVID public schooling in South Africa and its implications for school leadership. You know, I, I hope we just don't leave these conversations at this point, you know, and, uh, you know, it's my fervent wish that you build on these conversations in your professional learning communities and communities of practice so that we are able to build uh, resilient public schools. And in closing, you know, let me extend my deep gratitude to the presenters uh, for making time av available uh, to share their knowledge with us. A special thank you goes to the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the College of Humanities, uh, Professor Njlanjla Minkis, and the team at Corporate Relations, especially the hardworking uh, Ms. Kuliswa Zulu uh, and Ms. Uh, Melissa Manguru for supporting and for so efficiently putting this webinar together. My gratitude also goes out to uh, Ms. Nokukanya Ndlovu and uh, Dr. Bongani Mkees from the discipline Education, Leadership and Management at UKZN for the planning and coordination of this webinar. And lastly, folks, my thanks goes out to you for participating in this webinar. Thank you all for attending and take care and be safe. Goodbye all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Thank you Professor Naika. Thank you, Prof. Goodbye to all. Goodbye to Ms. Diamond, Ndlebe, and uh, Chikoko. Uh, all the best to you people. I hope I've covered everybody. Yes, to thank you. Too. Yes, thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.